Guest pastor, Pastor Adam King. Welcome back again, Adam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I apologize, my voice is not at its full strength, but I trust that God will enable you to hear me okay and He'll show His strength in, in my weakness. And as we come to the reading and the preaching of God's Word, let us seek the Lord's blessing and help in prayer. Lord, we acknowledge that we are, we are weak. and We stand in need of your strength, the strength that you've promised to supply to your people who ask in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come this morning doing precisely that, asking that as we look at your word and read the things that you have revealed to us. That your spirit will take of the things that are Christ's and give them to your people to build them up in the love of Christ, to strengthen their faith, to glorify himself. Lord, we need your spirit's work among us. And we are so grateful that we can come expecting and relying upon just that thing. We pray that you'll give strength in the preaching of the word and that the hearts that hear it will be prepared to be soft and fertile soil to bring forth the fruit of it in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. we be preaching from Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. The verses that we'll look at are verses 18 and 19. They're in your bulletin there. But for a little bit of context that is it's helpful to understand the whole of what Paul is doing, I'll be reading from verses 14 to 21. Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. What are the things that you pray for the most? What are the things that you desire the most intensely? What are the things that honestly would actually get you on your knees before God in prayer. We're allowed to pray for all sorts of things in the scripture, and we should. But surely, we ought to covet earnestly the best gifts. And here, Paul is modeling for us a more excellent way. As he shows us in his prayer what things the church needs so desperately, and what we ought to want that intensely. Some of the most lofty themes of the gospel have been covered so far in Ephesians 1 to 3. 
In these early chapters, Paul has been teaching the church about things like predestination, adoption, the resurrection power of Jesus at work in your regeneration, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, the breaking down of the barriers that the Old Testament law had set up to make one new man in the church, to the end that even the angels might behold and marvel at the wisdom of God. But these things, Paul isn't putting out there so that they can be mere theory, so that we can just know stuff. They're not here to be high theological truths that barely touch our lives other than by a mere knowledge or assent. Not at all. The prayer that he now prays is to the intent that the Spirit of God might take these truths and drive them home by way of application in the life of Christians so that those things might actually become a part of the life and experience that you have with God by faith. And the prayer shows us what that looks like, what it means in actual outworking. It is a dangerous thing, very dangerous, to only have knowledge in our heads that aren't brought home to be grasped by faith, to be lived and experienced in a transformed life before God. It is my hope that none of you here have a, a bare and barren profession of Christianity, but that these things might be true of you just as Paul prayed they would be for the Ephesians, just as Paul was praying they would be for all saints to include us even at the end of the ages. And as Paul is praying, that we might know experientially the fruit of his doctrine, among these requests for spiritual benefits, his prayer is ascending step by step until we get to this pinnacle of it here at the end, that we might know the love of Christ. Among all the different themes presented to us in the scripture, doesn't this one warm your heart like nothing else can if you are a Christian? So let's take time to meditate on this together today, making this prayer our own as we do. And I encourage you, as I'm preaching in your heart, actually be praying. The things you're hearing, the Spirit will take. That the Spirit will give you a hunger and a desire to know more of the love of Jesus. And that way, actively participating in this process, that you might reap the benefit by the Spirit's grace. And so, we'll look at this theme in two parts. First of all, in verse 18, that we might comprehend the measurements of Christ's love. And secondly, in verse 19, that we may know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Well, the first thing you'll notice in these verses is that Paul wants us to know the measurements or the dimensions of Christ's love. If Christ dwells in your heart by faith, as he's already talked about in verse 17, if you are already rooted and grounded in love, you can and you should know something more particular about the details of this love of Christ that is yours. It's as if it is described here like an object something tangible and physical that can be measured. In other words, Paul doesn't want us to be content with the general, with hazy awareness of it. 
Bible would have you inspect the love of Christ, measure it, know its details, that this love of Christ is yours. Can't we all agree as Christians that there is so much more for us to learn about Christ's love? What Christian is there who says, well, I, I know all that there is to know about the love of Jesus? None of us. But to the extent that we only have vague and ill-defined notions, general hard-to-explain feelings, we certainly don't know the love of Christ as well as we could. Isn't there far more comfort, far more enjoyment in the love of Christ, the more specific and definite that we can be about the content of it? Really, at the, at the far end of the spectrum, if what we claim we believe about the love of Jesus has no content that we can describe and explain. We have to be concerned and ask ourselves the question, do I really know this at all? Christianity is a religion of revealed truths. There is actual content and truth to these things. And if our religion is only in the fluctuating ups and downs of how I feel, my friends, you have not begun to understand what the gospel is talking about. And yet, even if we are not so far to that end of the spectrum, as Christians, we ought to desire to grow more and more in our specificity, more in our distinct, intelligent understanding of what the love of Christ means more than just something that is broad and feeling-driven. And that's why, one of the reasons why, Paul describes that love of Christ here in three dimensions, as if it were something, I don't know, not as if it were something, it is something that is real, objective, definite, knowable. There is absolutely nothing spiritual or helpful in the Christian life about ignorance. Nor is it as if love and knowledge are opposites, as if studying, analyzing details is somehow opposed to love. Elsewhere, Paul prayed for Christians in this way. I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. God would have us know more of the contours, of the shape, of the real thing that is Jesus' love for his people. And of course, that's completely understandable, isn't it? Even in human relationships, don't we take more delight when we know more about the spe with specificity about the lengths and to which people will go for us? about the depth of the intensity of the reality of a person's love? When you think about it as a Christian, what is the, the prime relationship that you have? Isn't it your relationship to Christ? The best, the truest, the realest relationship. And isn't it odd that oftentimes that's the easiest relationship we have in terms of understanding. We treat it as if it's less real than the relationships we have that we can see and experience here. It ought not to be that way. All of the things that make up the enjoyment of, of experience of knowing someone's love in a merely human relationship ought to be that much more true in terms of your relationship with Christ. And the Bible is here helping us, directing us how to do that, how to think about it and meditate it in, on it in a way that is profitable for us. <clears throat> Why are we so content, brothers and sisters, with the limited, with the shallow understanding of Christ's love, when God 
God himself is presenting it to us in a way that we can and should know more of its vastness, know more of its dimensions and details more thoroughly. Don't you want that? If you love Jesus at all, if you believe in him at all, don't you want to know more about what his love for you is? Then pray. Pray, because that is the only way that we will truly grow in our knowledge. A knowledge that will do us good spiritually, not by being mere intellectual knowledge, but a real biblical knowledge, is to ask God himself, who has promised that he will withhold no good thing from his people. After all, I mean, think about it. God has given us his son, and he's told us he will with him freely give us all things. Why would God give his son out of the depth of his love to us? and then not answer the prayers of his people to help them understand that love. That makes no sense, does it? It is the nature of love to want to be known. You think about it, if you have love for your, someone in your heart, you, you, you want to communicate, to express. You want them to know and understand to the extent that you don't or aren't able to communicate that you feel a pain and a misery inside. Well, God himself can experience no pain or misery as God, but the idea is the same in this, that, the, that Jesus, who has loved us, wants to communicate to his people to understand. And the more we seek that from him, the more we pray to him, asking him, that we might grow in that knowledge, he will not withhold those good things from his people. We find it's true in our experience so often, but we read elsewhere in the scripture that we have not, because we ask not, that we aren't really seeking it. Brothers and sisters, I hope you are this morning. I trust that you are. Well then, if this is the case, let us stop looking merely at the principle and let us go more towards a knowledge here of it as the scripture presents it. Let us look at how Christ's love is described for our comprehension. It has breadth and length and depth and height. And the point, of course, is to present it to our view as something enormous. It is not something small. It's not something that is easily and quickly grasped and measured. No. We pray because God must help us to take it in, in all of its vastness. And may God grant us the ability to see something of the enormity Christ's love today. What difference would that make in your Christian experience if you really had a real perception of how overwhelmingly big the love of Jesus was? If it loomed large in your view, what effect would that have on your joy on your peace, on your comfort, on your trust. Oh, brothers and sisters, don't we often live so far below our privileges? Don't we so often live below what the Lord holds out for us in Scripture? Let us delve down into the details then. And first of all, let us look at how Paul describes it. How broad is the love of Christ? It reaches 
to the ends of the earth. It covers within its canopy not just a few, but multitudes upon multitudes, all of the elect from every age, a throng and a multitude that no one can number. The scripture describes it as a multitude made up of all types, of all classes, whether they be the outwardly respectable, those sinners still, or those who have horrible backgrounds, male and female, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. And if you can think of any other class and division and way to break down men as men so often love to do, the love of Jesus is not restricted by such things. It covers all manner of people. And praise God for that. But when we think about the love of Christ being broad and being extended, it's easy for us to get a misconception in our mind. Because for you and, and me, when we think about love, the, the closer that relationship is, the stronger it is. And the farther away that relationship gets from us, the weaker it is, the general, more general it is. I mean, at a very practical level, isn't that true? Your love for your immediate family is far more intense than for the stranger that is only barely known to you. Of course it is. It wouldn't be practical or workable for it to be any other way. Or think of it in nature. The river that runs widest often runs shallowest as well. And yet it is not like this with the love of Christ. No matter how far his love extends, no matter how broad it is, it is not diminished. It is not stretched tight and thin. The whole number of all his elect can shelter under it and experience it in its fullness. Because there really is no farther away out of the circle when it comes to the Christian's relationship to Jesus. We receive not only some small portion of it alone, but the whole of the love of Christ in its fullness. Is that not amazing? No matter how many Christians there are, no matter how they are multiplied, the love of Jesus to you, individual Christian, is not diminished or reduced. Or to look at it another way. How broad, how wide is the love of Christ? How broad is your sin? The Bible gives us pictures of sin in the Old Testament to help us understand it. One of those pictures is the plague of leprosy. And think about how leprosy spreads. It cannot be contained. It goes out of all bounds. The little spot in the flesh soon covers the whole of the body. The, the uh, leprosy which was in the house soon expands and the whole building has to be torn down. In fact, it is hard to even measure something finite like our sin. Who among us can accurately describe the full extent of it in our own lives alone? And yet the love of Christ is so broad that it covers the full extent of the sins of his people. To the extent that David could sing, Blessed is he whose sin is covered. And how wide and how broad is the love of Christ extended? It does not cover our sin alone. He does not cover just that. But all of the sins of all his elect 
spreading forth his skirt to cover our nakedness. How broad is the reach of his love, extended so far as to gather all his people under his wings like the hen of her chicks. But again, what is the length of Christ's love? How long is it? And it's good to ask ourselves these things and, and meditate on them because Paul is using these words for the purpose of, of prompting you to ask those questions and answer them in the specifics. How long is the love of Christ, brother? Does it not reach from eternity to eternity? Hear this verse out of Jeremiah 31. The Lord hath appeared of old, saying unto me, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Have you ever really just stopped and tried to think about what that really means? In eternity, before you ever existed, Christian, Jesus loved you. He, after all, predestinated us in love. Do you ever struggle wondering with whether the love of Jesus will last towards you? With whether you will ever wear it out, that it will come to an end? One writer has taken this thought of the eternity of the love of Christ and encouraged us in this way. The best proof that he will never cease to love us lies in that he never began. The idea being this, there was no time before which Jesus didn't love his people. You can't go back far enough to find that point where he didn't and then he started. That's not how it works. And if his love to his people is, is eternal in that way, there is never any chance of it ending or coming to a close. Even if we were to bring that down to the merely human level, think of it as those of you who have children. Will you ever stop loving your children? can. And do we think that Jesus will stop loving his? May it never be. And this love from eternity to eternity reaches into time because that's where we are. That's where we live. We're time bound. We exist in time, and the love of Christ descends from eternity into your actual experience here. Christian, if that is true, you are never outside of the reach of his love. Whither shall you go from his spirit? Or whither shall you flee from his loving presence? If you ascend up to heaven, it is there. If you make your bed in hell, it is there. And how many times has he proven to you that his love, even as his hand, is not shortened that it cannot save? And he has reached out to the far country to where as a prodigal you have fled and brought you back to your father's house and to your father's embrace. You will never be able to outrun the reach, the length of the love of Christ. And oh, what 
depth there is to the love of Christ as well. Put it another way, what bottom is there to the heart of God? Or as someone else has described it, how can we measure the distance between heaven's throne and Bethlehem's manger? The distance between the Father's bosom and the cross and the grave. What does that mean for you? When your sins are so many that they are above your head, when in affliction all his waves and his billows are gone over you, when you are sunk low and cry by reason of your affliction from the belly of hell, his love can reach you there. There he has. And it can continue. In this life, you are never so low. You are never so far gone that you are beyond the reach of the love of Christ. You want to talk about deep? Does that truth not overwhelm your heart? Well, then what is the height of the love of Christ? It is as high as heaven. It is a love that not only takes us from the mire and sets our feet upon the rock, but it lifts us up from hell and settles us in heaven. If it is that high, the effects of it are that great, what are the obstacles that we encounter in this life that are really obstacles to the love of Jesus? One of the most, to me, beautiful symbols of this is found in the Song of Solomon, a book that majors on this topic of the love of Christ to his people. And it describes the mountains of division, those high walls and rocks that would separate the bride from her beloved seemingly. All of the, the obstacles and the hindrances that we encounter in this world. And what do we read of Jesus in that book? He comes skipping over the tops of them. Who can skip over the tops of mountains? Ah, but to the love of Christ, there is no hindrance from his love reaching his people. Or to put it in other biblical language, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. But when we are taught to measure the height which overcomes all obstacles, we can say in faith, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But you know, as if this weren't enough, Paul acknowledges in verse 19 that Christ's love is so vast, it passeth knowledge. And you want just one example of that passing knowledge? In John 17, 23, Jesus prays that we might know that God has loved us as he loved Who can fathom that? How has God the Father loved his Son? And Jesus says that we are brought into that love. Christian, you will never get your arms fully around that. Here we come to the limits and beyond 
of what we can find out by study, we have to come to experience. Before Paul talks about comprehending these truths, here he says you can't comprehend it. It's a knowledge that passes knowledge. What is that? (laughs) It means that no matter how much you apply your mind or even your sanctified mind to it, you'll never be able to fully get it. But that doesn't mean it's beyond your reach. He prays that you'll know it. He prays that you will experience this love of Christ. And this is absolutely vital for us to pray as well. Because there are two serious dangers in the church today. And we swing the pendulum between them. And if we fall into either ditch, we're in serious trouble. There's the peril on one side of having a contentless idea of the love of Christ that is not saving at all because we don't know anything about it. It's just this feeling that I have. And for too many people, their religion is what they feel. And there is nothing to it other than that. But on the other side of that pendulum swing is the danger that our knowledge of Christ and his love and the truths of the scripture are only theoretical. Yeah, I can talk to you about it. I can explain it. I can quote Bible verses. But do you actually know it in your heart? Because unless it is there, you are lost. And oh, what a sad, horrible, tragic thing it would be and is that many people will go down into hell who can talk to you at length about what the love of Christ is. May that not be any of you. May you know experientially, personally, what this love of Christ means. Do you know that? Pray. Pray for it. It's the only way it will be achieved. And God will not withhold this either from the believing request of his longing child. Any more than the parent can harden his heart against the child that comes to him and, and wants to experience the love of his father with his arm outstretched. Hug me, Father. Why do we think that God is the kind of father that would, in disgust, you know, turn away the child that would do that? That is not the picture of God presented in the scripture. Do you want to know the love of Christ experientially? Do you want that to be your experience in Christ? Come to him in faith and prayer. He will not disappoint you. We need this. You know, so often, not only in our own Christian experience are things barren and cold, but in the life of the church today, it is dead and barren, dry. You think church is dry and boring? I hope not, but if you do, here is a biblical solution to know the love of Christ, to come into his presence, to experience by grace more of his love. Nothing would ever be able to keep you away again. Well, then one final word of application, and I'll close. This beautiful, this surpassing love is not something that is cheap. It is not something that is ineffective and wasted on its despisers. You know, so often in the culture and in the broader Christian circles, the love of Jesus is wrongly presented as if Jesus is just this good-natured kind of guy who loves just the whole world and is standing there hoping that somebody will love him back. And the way that this is, is presented is in such a way that it puts all the power into the hands of sinners to take him or leave him as they will, and he'll be there if they decide they need to come back to him later. My hearers, this is not the Jesus of Scripture. This isn't 
idol. The Jesus of Scripture has a true and genuine and deep love. But it is a love for saints, as Paul points out here. It is a love for those who have him in their hearts by faith. And if you do not have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, do not deceive yourselves that you are in his love. For the scripture plainly testifies that the Lord is angry with the wicked every day and hates sinners. But let that warning not discourage us from this either. That although the love of Christ is not this cheap thing thrown out there to be wasted, nevertheless, it is genuinely and freely offered to whosoever will believe on Christ. You cannot earn it. You cannot deserve it. But you can have it by faith. Turn from your sin. Embrace Jesus as the substitute sufferer for your sin, as your prophet, as your priest, and yes, as your king. Know it for yourself. The love of Jesus is far better than my weak words can describe today. It is alluring. It is wooing. But if you will not have it, know that you will know his wrath. Just as his love passeth knowledge, Moses testifies, who knoweth the power of his anger? You will. You will know it in its depth sinking you into hell for eternity. And so the real question is, why? Why? You know, we say that's foolishness, and it is, but that doesn't even quite capture the strength of just how stupid it is to reject the love of Christ, to experience and embrace his wrath. Is it any wonder that the scripture says, turn ye, turn ye, why will he die? And my hearers, I have literally bowed my knees in prayer this week that God would grant to each of you not to be in such a case as this, but to know the love of Christ in your hearts by faith. To know this love. Come, come and know with all the saints this love by being joined to his saints by faith, by being a saint, by faith in him. And do you know what you will find? You will find that not only will you begin to grasp more and more of the love of Christ, but you will find exactly what Paul says here that he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You stand with me in prayer. Lord, we are heartened by the love of Jesus that is presented to us this morning. And pray that hearts are melted, that we are softened and allured by it, to love him too. That the more that we grow by faith in the knowledge of the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that our love for him might deepen and become broader and longer as well. That we might live in the love of Christ until that blessed day 
when we will be like him and see him as he is. Lord, if there are any without faith this morning, please, by your spirit, grant them to know these things. Give them a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. And may they rejoice to know, to revel in the love of Christ and to find that even in their rebellion, he has loved them too with an everlasting love. And glorify yourself in all of us and in your church and in the lives and experience of all saints, whether here in Wichita or anywhere else in the world, that you might be glorified in all in all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And receive his blessing upon you, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Despair.